My name is Matt Roberts. Uh, let's talk uh, a little bit. As I said at the uh, at the outset, the origins of this meeting, at least as far as I know, I don't know. Dr. Mosier may uh, may correct me. Uh, was that this was always, or actually, Dr. Lines probably would know as as well uh, or better than anybody. This was originally kind of the secret preview. Uh, this is where everything got honed up before taking it out. Uh, on the county, and so within that, uh, with that spirit, I do have a few things I want to try out here. Uh, we'll get to those. Uh, what I want to talk about in, in grain markets, it's been interesting to go through the day. We opened with Doug Southgate talking about the, uh, the 50, the 75 year view of agriculture and of food demand and of demographics. Uh, we talked, uh, then, then Ian Sheldon came in. He gave sort of a, a somewhat shorter time span uh, so to hear Doug talk about it, all these demographic trends are leveling out. It's not going to be a problem 50 years from now because uh, apparently, I, did he say people were going to stop having sex or start dying? I don't remember which, but it had something to do with one of those. Um, and then we hear Ian uh, get up here and he said, well, but in the meantime, we still have these spikes. Uh, they're exacerbated. I'm going to talk about, I guess, the much shorter term, and that is really uh, the 6 to 12 month outlook. I think when we look at these, the big questions right now in the agricultural markets uh, are the progress of the winter crops, not only the North American, but as well, honestly, uh, European and, and uh, European and Soviet winter wheat or former Soviet winter wheats, uh, as well as the South American uh, soybean and corn crops. Uh, those are right now probably, and we'll get into exactly why, probably where most of the market's attention is focused. Uh, U.S. export pace, especially in soybeans right now, uh, very, very fast. Um, we'll get to that more. Moisture conditions in the United States. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, to, to Carl got up. He gave his disclaimer uh, that he is an actual farmer. Uh, he does receive payments. I am on the opposite end of that spectrum. Uh, I guess legally my name does show up in the EWG Database, I own, I think, 6%, you've heard me say, uh, of our family, uh, family cattle ranch. Uh, so I have no tie to it. When I think about U.S. moisture, I simply think about the fact that this fall has been glorious uh, in every way except football. Um, it's actually still been pretty good, just I guess it's the December that's not so good. Uh, but I look at the weather. It's been beautiful. It's been warm. Uh, it's been dry. That's great as long as you're not looking for next year, thinking about planting for next year or thinking about the wheat that you have in the ground. Uh, and then finally, the adjustment in animal inventories. Uh, what has happened to demand in the United States? So where I want to start, this does kind of harken back to some of the charts we saw earlier, and that is to talk about some of the drivers right now in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, Chinese meat consumption from 1990, this is 1990 to 2013. Uh, you've seen me probably show a similar graph to this. Beef and veal along the bottom. Uh, this is chicken at the top, and that is all pork. All that green is pork. And so in just over 20 years, they've gone total consumption uh, from 27 million metric tons to 72 million metric tons, and almost all of that change is in pork. Okay, almost all of that change is in pork. They are the world, over half the world's hogs, as you've probably all heard, are grown in China, and they are the world's largest single importer of pork. Um, it's hard to get your, your mind around just how large that industry is. Um, it is also not this industry that we tend to think of. Uh, this is not a backward small industry. It is uh, many of their operations are very first world. They do not look out of place or would not look out of place uh, in Iowa, in Nebraska, uh, or in the southeast. They are very productive. They can be very productive, and the scale has really pushed that. And so if you're going to grow that many hogs, if you're going to grow that many birds, you've got to be able to feed them. There's the numbers. I'm updating my slides over the weekend. Chinese oilseed consumption growing by 13, average of 13% per year since 1990. Stop and think about that. What else has grown? I, I have trouble thinking about anything that's grown by 13% a year over two decades, with the possible exception of the U.S. money supply. Um, it is astounding. Okay, and so this is oilseed use. 
the blue here on the top, the bottom three, uh, or four, I guess, but you know, we, it's hard to see a sunflower seed, but you can see peanut is growing some, uh, rape seed, cotton seed a little, but almost all of this growth is in soybean. And so we can go back 10 million metric tons uh, 20 years ago. We're now talking in beans about 80 million metric tons, an eight-fold increase in beans in two decades. Okay? And this doesn't, by the way, I did not go in here and I did not put in soybean oil imports. I did not put in meal imports. This is just, or vegetable oil or, or any sort of protein meal. This is just the beans themselves, just the oil seed consumption itself. And so really dramatic growth. Uh, Chinese grain consumption, uh, not as dramatic, but still 4% per year since 2006. We've really seen that take off as their feeding, as their um, feeding operations, as their animal operations do become more concentrated and more efficient, that feed ration has become more like what we would be used to, and so we are seeing it standardized. And so the reason I put all, I, I want to start with all this, and I think the reason this ties together, the more I've thought about it, the common denominator in all of this, and I think that we have to continue. I've been saying this for a year, maybe two years. You guys probably know better than me. Uh, you hear me at sort of one-year intervals, but is land. It's easy to talk about bushels. It's easy to talk about metric tons. It's easy to talk about all these different measures, but at the end of the day, it all goes back to land because at the end of the day, all of these agricultural uh, outputs are competing for land. Okay, um, this is something I started talking about five years ago uh, with the, the boom in, in, um, uh, in biofuels, the boom in ethanol, and everybody's talking about, well, cellulosic won't be so bad because cellulosic, we're going we're gonna to make it from switchgrass that we're going to plant out on all the unused land. You know, we'll make it productive with all the unused land. You know, we just need to plant 50, 75 million acres with switchgrass and miscanthus, and we're good. So where's their 50 to 75 million acres of unused land? I'm still waiting for that, that answer, okay? Um, that land isn't really unused. It may have cows on it. It may not be as intensively produced. We go to Mato Grosso in Brazil to the Cerrados. Those are grazed, okay? That's not land that's just sitting there. It's the savanna. Uh, it's like a South American savanna. And so it all goes back to land because it's all competing for land. And so if you take these changes... Uh, Chinese soybean imports in 2011, about 1.9 billion bushels total imports. Uh, that is, has gone up uh, in the previous decade. So from 2001 to 2011, that, in, that about tripled. So it went from about 15 million. Uh, I'm sorry, tripled from about 600 million bushels to about 1.9 billion. U.S. yields or Brazilian or Argentine yields take about 45 million acres to satisfy 1.9 billion. Uh, bushels. So that's about 30 million acre increase in 10 years. We go to U.S. ethanol. Okay, that's the other thing we hear a lot about. Uh, U.S. ethanol increasing demand, uh, the effect that it's had on global grain markets. Uh, U.S. ethanol usage is about 5 billion bushels of corn. It's obviously lower this year, but in 11 was 5 billion bushels. Net out DGS, it's about 3.4 billion bushels. Pretty much all of that has been in the last decade. So in 10 years, it's gone, and it, I'm sorry, it takes 22 million acres to grow that. So in 10 years, it's gone from zero to 22 million acres. So those two sources of demand right there, 50 million acres it takes to meet those. That's 50 million acres of demand that wasn't there a decade previous. Okay? Because a third of that 45 was already there 10 years ago. They were already importing. That was 600 million bushels they imported in 2000. So that is, so that's 50 million acres, okay? It's a 50 million acre change in a decade. Now, mind you, that's just the top two sources of additional demand in the early 2000s. We're not talking about South Korean demand. We're not talking about Indonesian or Brazilian domestic demand. Uh, we're not talking about all these other countries that have seen their own demand. We're not talking about increased feed grain demand in China. Okay, and this is all exports from, or just these two sources, 50 million more acres in 10 years. Now what roughly, how many acres of row crops does 
Ohio produce in a year? Anybody know? Cheryl still here? She's supposed to know these things off the top of her head. Nope. Roughly nine, a little over nine, but I like to round to 10 because it keeps the numbers easy. Okay? Roughly 10 million acres. So that means we've needed half an Ohio per year added in production at first world yields just to meet these two additional sources of demand. So you want to know why row crop prices, or why crop prices, commodity prices, all agricultural prices have gone up so much? This is where that story starts. We haven't seen demand for cotton rise like this. But what does cotton need? Cotton needs land. Okay, and it's competing for that land against these two demand sources. Okay, and so that's true across the entire, all, everything that is produced from the land, which is all of agriculture. And that's why we need to remember. And if you want to know one of the primary reasons land prices have gone up, right there. Ultimately, what the demand is for is for land. Okay, it is ultimately for land. So when we turn this and we turn this around, we start thinking about individual crops. Uh, looking at global corn inventories at 14% in the current marketing year, we expect next year to end uh, with uh, about 14% of a year's usage in inventory. We can go back significantly lower than we had back in the food spike in six, seven, eight. Uh, in fact, the lowest that we've had. Uh, I know going back at least to the early 70s. Very, very low corn inventories. Uh, obviously, we see that reflected in prices. Okay. Um, oops, I moved. I'm sorry. I meant to leave the other two. Beans and, and, uh, beans and wheat, those are in their respective commodities right now. Uh, so I, I'll give part of this, this uh, punchline away. The global stock situation is tight. You're going to see, like I said, when you get to beans, we get to wheat, you're going to see it. It's tight across all three. Wheat is not as tight as during the food spike, neither is beans, but they are tight. And that simply means that there is less buffer stock for any sort of a production interruption. Okay? Um, but the assumptions, even under these, even when we look at this corn number, this already incorporates this spring's harvest in South America, in Argentina, which is a very aggressive estimate. And if you look at the weather conditions in Argentina, it has been so wet recently that in fact they have now stopped their corn planting. They're starting, some of them are starting to switch into bean planting to try and keep corn from uh, being, uh, going through pollination during the hottest part of the year. Okay, certainly it's going to cost them yield because of some of those shifts. And so these already assume very good production. Um, like I said, uh, record harvest in South America and good winter wheat harvest in U.S. And we are at historically poor crop condition numbers for U.S. wheat. Historically poor. Okay? Uh, as we go into dormancy. So that's, that's problematic. I'm not going to go through all these numbers. I realize there's a lot of numbers here. Um, this is as I've been updating this uh, in preparation for this meeting. What I did was I just Let's create a spreadsheet. Let's come up with some scenarios. I do this every year. Um, I assume we're going to plant about a half a million acres. Just why? Why not? I mean, acreage planting is early December. Uh, I know a lot of people have very complicated models, but ultimately everybody's just making it up. Okay? I saw this great Dilbert. I didn't get it in here. I saw it actually this morning. Um, it was Dilbert basically asserting that really numbers you make up are just as good. Uh, as the numbers that you actually create, at a, create or that come out of your models. As an economist, I, I really felt at one with that and at peace with that. So I'll be honest, 96 and a half million acres, I made it up. It's half a million acres less than what we think we planted this year. Seems about right to me. Uh, area harvested obviously will be up a little more. Uh, what I did on yield per harvested acres, I'll be very clear. Whatever trend line yield you want, uh, please talk to me. I have a model for your yield. Uh, when I look at about the eight models that I follow, they do end up. I mean, last year's yield is much lower. Its projected yield is much lower than this year's yield. And that kind of, I mean, in kind of the mid-150s. We went into last year with the trend line thinking 161. 
And so I, I kind of wrestled with that a little and then started actually looking and doing some counting. Here's an interesting question. How many years has the United States had a national yield in corn above 150? Anybody have a guess? Above 150. Five. In the history of mankind, or at least the, you know, the republic. I'll be honest, I didn't actually go back that far. Uh, I only went back to 1990, but I felt it safe to assume we didn't have over 150 <laughs> bushels per acre prior to 1990. We've had five years of yields above 150. Two of those were above 160. And that's it. Okay, that's it. So I looked at it and said, well, okay, 157 was kind of in the middle. It's a little on the high side of the middle. Well, maybe that's not so ridiculous, just as kind of a baseline. So at 88.78 harvested at 157 yield. That's just a shade under 14 billion bushel harvest. And that's where things got interesting because I had to find a home then for, four, for 14 and a half billion bushels. And it gets hard. It gets hard. That is a lot of corn. And it's a lot of corn because we're not getting that 600 million bushel a year, every year increase in eth from the ethanol industry. That we've been that we've had for so many years. So, um, Howard, having you up here, it's bringing out my Baptist pastor in me. I'm, I just got an amen. This is awesome. <laughs> but so I looked down. I mean, you can go into you can go into ethanol. You know, you're, we're going to ramp that right back up to five billion bushels. Uh, we can go up to feed. You push that up to a number we haven't been to for three or four years. Can we do that? I don't know. I mean, animals get hungry. Um, but if we're going to push that much feed in there, we can't do it at $6 a bushel, six twenty dollars a bushel, okay? As we, to find a home for this many bushels leads me to believe that we do need to see, if we're going to have harvests like this, we need significantly lower prices. Now, I don't work out, I'll be honest, my models for what this means in prices, I end up, I work pretty hard and end up with a 1.3 billion bushel ending stocks. I think that works out probably to a 490 average farm price, 480 average farm price. Okay, um, but I'll be honest, this is that's guesswork, especially when you go into a forecast like this. I expect guys to probably forward a lot. That's going to throw things off. But I think it's very. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect uh, 475, 480 futures at harvest. Okay. I don't think, under a pretty normal scenario. We go and break down, look at the individual pieces. Um, this year, our feed demand is back to 1996 levels. Our use of, of corn in feeding back at 96 levels. And that's still including DGS, that blue line. Okay, like I said, with ethanol demand, uh, 2013, we're talking about 13.8 billion gallons. Uh, still well under. We've got 15.2 billion gallons of capacity in the country. Uh, so still, uh, we have no problem in meeting that. Exports in corn have fallen off a lot. It's what we'd expect due to high prices. Fundamental demand is still there. Uh, we're just seeing a lot of price-based rationing. Not surprising. So we look at the overall U.S. picture. This is just U.S. Uh, these red bars at the bottom our, um, our stock use ratio, 6.5% stock use ratio. We go back, we look, that's the lowest we've had since 95, 96. Okay, tightest corn market we've had since 95, 96. Actually quite a bit tighter than what we had back the first time we experimented with $8 corn. Okay, what that tells us is a lot of the foundations, or at least what I think, a lot of the foundations in uh, rationing that were laid back then, finally, it, you know, we kind of felt it now, a lot of those changes. But as we think going forward, what's going on in the market and what's really driving the market, very, very wet in Argentina. This is 10-day rain in Argentina. These dark blue spots right here are 200% uh, or more, the dark blue. So they have localized flooding in Argentina. It has almost entirely stopped 
corn planting. Some areas that have not gotten the 200%, but instead are just somewhat wet, have now switched, like I said before, into beans. I don't quite understand that. I'm going to assume that's a southern hemisphere thing. Um, it gets very complicated down there. That's what I, at least that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But when we look at the United States, and I think the market is pricing this in. It's pricing this in because there is so little inventory out there. The buffer stocks are so low. Normal year, eh, Argentina planning not going great. That's worth a dime. This year, when we're talking about 650 million bushels of ending inventories, that matters a lot. Okay, that matters a lot. When we look at uh, drought conditions or moisture, soil moisture conditions across the United States, you know, look at this line right there. Northwest Illinois, all the way down, northwest Missouri, all of Kansas, pretty much all of Nebraska, all of Iowa, southern Minnesota, uh, the Dakotas all very, very dry. Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, very, very dry. We come out, you know, Ohio, Indiana, most of Illinois in good shape, which is nice, but most of the country exceedingly dry right now. Heart of the corn belt. And the wheat belt, you know, look at that when it comes to the wheat belt. You know, very bad situation or very bad scenario right there uh, shaping up. And so this is not, I mean, you, no offense to anybody who's involved in wheat. We know wheat is oftentimes called an edible weed. It's very, very resilient. Uh, we have seen a lot of times where you get to this point, you have poor conditions. Uh, it's, it's amazing its resiliency. So this dye is not yet cast, but it is setting up poorly for wheat next year especially. I'll talk about that a bit more. But still, even with corn, I mean, looking at this, yes, there's a lot of time to make this moisture up. But this isn't really, especially after what we've seen the last two years, this is not where we want to be right now thinking about 2013. Okay, after two years of rough conditions, we'd like to be setting up better than we are. Okay, so summary of corn, what's going to happen to yields in January final crop report? Market really worries. I've got no inside information. If I did, I wouldn't share it. I'd simply trade it. But I don't. What we instead have is lots and lots of anecdotes without much data, okay? Lots of anecdotes. Uh, we have a lot of people talking about this, that, the other. Listen, first thing first, NAS. I know the guys who do the, the national level crop report. They work very hard. They're straight up. The guy who's head of it, Joe Prasaki, grew up on a farm in Iowa. Sharp guy, understands the importance of it, okay? Um, working really hard. There's no manipulation here. Say, you know, save your conspiracies, please. Or I, I, I'm sorry. You guys wouldn't have such conspiracies. Please share with your neighbors uh, to save their conspiracy, except Bruce. He probably does. Uh, but the rest of you wouldn't have conspiracies about NAS. Um, save those for later. They work really hard. They have as good a data as anybody. Um, I think that we will probably see this, these uh, harvest estimates rise a little bit based upon basis behavior and price behavior. Market has not yet gotten as tight as people thought it would. Now that, who knows where we're going to end up. That, um, that grain stocks report is going to be especially key to get an idea on what's been happening with animal feeding. We get four snapshots a year of animal feeding, and that's going to be one of them. Um, we turn to beans. Global situation is extremely tight, especially right now. We have to remember those USDA uh, numbers are marketing year numbers, and they are North American marketing year numbers. So they hold. When we look at current stock use ratios right now, global stock, this is global stock use ratio. Uh, when we look at this number, this 23%, that is the... Uh, 12 harvest in North America, and that's the projected 13, spring 13 harvest in South America, our spring, okay? It's coming in six months. All right, now we are through planting. So far, things are shaping up quite good, but we're still a long ways away from being able to uh, count on that, okay? And what happened last year? What happened last spring in South America? It was bad. They had a very severe drought. You look at this yellow line. If we calculated stock use ratios as ending in this January instead of next uh, August, instead of having 23%, we'd be at 
if you think of it on a calendar year. Why? South America just had an awful harvest. Now North America had an awful harvest. Okay? So right now, the global soybean market is exceedingly tight. Um, domestic demand, uh, it's actually it's been revised up, but it does continue to weaken. primary reason it continues to weaken is there's simply a lot of demand for raw beans in the rest of the world. Okay? A lot of demand for raw beans bids it out of the United States. Soy exports right now, we're up to 1.35 billion bushels. Uh, I'm shocked that exports have been this strong. Uh, let me tell you, if you want to see something, some place that, well, Speaking as a grain analyst, there's lots of places we've been consistently wrong. But nowhere have we been as consistently wrong as trying to figure out uh, export demand, global demand for soybeans. Okay? To say that we have the prices in the stock situation we do with 1.35 billion bushels in exports is crazy. And that number is going to go up. The reason we are pretty certain it's going to go up is we have already sold 75% of 1.345 billion bushels of soybeans. We've already contracted for that. Normally this time of year we would have only contracted for about 52, 53 percent of that number. And we're now at 75 percent. That means either we expect a massive drop in February, March, or that this number is too low. The reason that general consensus is this number is too low is even if South America has a very, very large harvest, they don't have the logistics to get it to port quick enough. They always spend, they've, the last few years, they've spent the first eight weeks getting as much moved out as they can. That hasn't changed. Okay, so the, just because they're going to have a large harvest doesn't mean that availability in the global market is going to change any compared to previous years until sort of the May time frame. Now, we look at Brazilian moisture. Previous maps were down here, uh, Argentina. Now we go up to Brazil. This is Mato Grosso, okay, um, yeah, that's right, and we see all the way down we're getting good moisture in the primary growing areas, far south not so much, but this is primary soy and corn growing areas, uh, good moisture especially in the last 10 days, okay. Mato Grosso had actually been relatively dry the last 10 days, it's starting to get wetter, south has been, dry, has been wet and it is actually starting to dry up. So just breaking perfectly. So there is reason to suspect some very large crops there, but it's still early. Uh, dependent, again, global markets very, very tight, dependent on that South American crop. Uh, export demand, I th still think, is underestimated. The real kicker here, and this is true of also of corn, what happens if the Mississippi River closes? Uh, we've seen water levels continuing to decline due to that severe dryness. Uh, way up in the farthest reaches, especially the Missouri River uh, watershed. Um, there is a lot of talk that in the next week they may have to shut down the Mississippi to barge traffic because they simply won't have enough water flow to support it. Okay? If that's the case, then this throws a lot of this off because it means that we're not going to be able to ship beans out to feed that market. I'm not exactly sure big picture what that means. Small picture, it means collapsing basis. Uh, but big picture, it means that that demand is just going to grow. Uh, that voracious demand is, is not going to be sated for a bit. So I, I honestly, a couple reasons. I, I think there's room still for higher prices, even with these large, um, at least in the very short term, um, for soy, primarily because we're in such a tight market globally until South America becomes available. Now, having said all that, Mississippi River closed, it doesn't matter that demand is so strong if we can't get it there. It will not be worth it for you to drive your trucks to New Orleans. I assure you of that, okay? Uh, yes, there will be trains going. Uh, they'll be going, I'm sure, quite a bit, but um, it's gonna, it will really hurt basis, local basis, if that happens. Uh, world wheat supplies, we're now 26% stock use ratio we expect for the current marketing year, significantly higher than, uh, than five years ago. That's a good thing. I would argue it was low wheat inventory that really created that very sharp price spike that we had. Uh, now, you may say, look, hey, in 2012, we got to pretty much the same prices that we did in 08, so what's the difference? The difference is we started from a much higher point. 
Okay, realistically, it was a move from uh, $3 to $8 in a year and a half back in 08. Now we're talking about a move from $5 to $8 in a year, okay, or a year and a half. So very different uh, kind of dynamics there. Uh, even with the low plantings, the red bars in front are soft red winter stocks, very ample, okay, lots of soft red. We've seen them get drawn down over the last two years. Historically, still a lot out there. Soft red still not competitive for a lot of exports. It's not garnering a lot of exports. We have seen a decent amount of feed use of soft red, especially in the southeast, especially among poultry producers. Uh, it's a lot easier to blend into the ration for poultry simply because the quicker life cycle on poultry allows you to keep the bird on a, wheat, uh, on a partially wheat ration for its entire lifespan instead of with cattle uh, where you'd have to, you might have to change that feed ration. So I want to talk very briefly, uh, you know, when it comes to marketing, my marketing takeaway. Now, again, this is one of these things. Uh, last five years, I've been saying, guys, prices I think are going down. Clearly, the last five years, your most profitable thing was to do exactly the opposite of what I've said. Um, hopefully, you have nevertheless derived some value out of my uh, witty stories and jokes. Uh, because certainly that's probably the, been the most value uh, I can claim to the state from marketing advice standpoint. Um, is Tim still here? Because I've got to figure out how that goes into my annual report. I don't know how to value that. But if you've got ideas, let me know. Um, Inversely correlated. Uh, something. So what I've done here, this is actually something last year I was sitting in the back of the room uh, in Attica. Uh, listening to Carl speak, it was after a Q&A and &A in a meeting like this, and I just kind of plotted this out to look at this. And what I've done uh, to simplify this a little, left-hand side is what happens to yield in a given year. Okay, yield versus trend in a given year. Each of those dots is a year from 1975 to 2010. The up and down is what happened to prices the following year. What happened to prices the following year? And so if you take, uh, let's see, take this dot right here, uh, better yet, now let's take the 2010 dot. 2010 dot, that is a year in which uh, yields were about 7% below, I think that's right, about 7% below what they were expected. Prices, however, rose about 18% in the following year. So in 2010, yields were about 7% below. The following year, prices went up 18%. Okay. So I did this plot, why? Well, look at those four quadrants. The four quadrants, upper right is a high yield year. The next year, prices go up. Lower right, high yield year. The next year, prices go down. Now, if you look, in years in which yield is above trend, 10 of them go up, 11 of them go down. And there's that one right there kind of on the line. But 10 of them up, 11 down. So it's really a coin toss. It's a coin toss. Where's your inventory? Somewhere else. <laughs> you can pretty much correlate them along the x-axis here. Look at the left side. Look at the left side. If you have low yield in a given year, okay, the following year prices go up three times and they go down ten times. They go up three, they go down ten. Now conveniently, um, I actually let my data subscription lapse. So when I tried to update these Friday, I didn't have my data subscription, so I couldn't update it, which is great because I know that it would now be 4 and 10 uh, if I put 11's harvest in there. But here's my defense. What happened in, why is 10 all by itself out there? Why is 10 all by itself? What happened in the following year? 2010, we had poor harvest, about a 7% 7% below trend. 2011, poor harvest, below trend harvest. 2012, severe drought. Okay? So as long as you are not expecting 2013 to be droughty, there's a really good chance prices go down. Okay? If it's droughty, guess what? Prices go up. You may say, well, that seems do obvious, Dr. Roberts. Well, obvious can be important as well. Okay, but look at, let's talk about what are the odds you get each of those outcomes. I won't go through beans. Beans are messier. The same pattern is there. It's not as strong, 
primarily because of South America. Okay, it dilutes it because there is another harvest cycle there. But in corn, most years' yields are above trend. If you cut that off at a 5% below, that kind of looks like the break point in that previous chart. So you go 5% below, one-third of years have yields that are 5% or farther below. Two-thirds of the time, yields are at least 5% below or greater. Okay? 60% of the time, yields are above average. It's kind of like Lake Wobegon. If you don't understand why, we can talk later. But 60% of years, yields are above average. 66% of the time, they are 5% below or greater. So in other words, there's only a third of the years in which it's less than a 5% disappointment. So in any given year, there's about a two-thirds chance, if you're coming off a short crop year, that the following year you'll see a decline in prices and probably a pretty significant decline in prices if you go back and look at that. Okay? And that has real implications for, uh, that has real implications for marketing. What it means is the current prices, frankly, two-thirds, there's about a 66% chance the current prices will be significantly lower at harvest. So if you're marketing for the odds, it means you sell heavily now. It means you sell or price heavily now. And then if you're worried about what happens if you miss $7, you know, if $6 isn't enough for you, then you buy that back with options. You buy some out-of-the-money call options. Okay, this is actually, I can show you slides, is what I said 12 months ago, all right? But I'm not saying you should go buy the call options. Odds are those don't necessarily pay off. But if that's what it takes for you to go ahead and just accept that $6 corn might be okay, something that you've waited your entire life for, then that's one way to handle that, okay? So that's the marketing, and that's true in corn and beans. I think there is less downside in beans only because Chinese demand seems insatiable. Um, I can't put a number on it. I haven't met anybody who can. Every year, anybody tries to quantify it, they're rudely disappointed. Uh, the one thing I want to talk really briefly about, this is the stuff I, I've not ventured into very much. I'm starting to uh, because, darn it, it matters, uh, especially in a year like this, to talk about what these prices have done uh, to animal inventories. Uh, I historically have described myself as a stationary foods economist, um, and I've left self-propelled foods to somebody else. Uh, self-propelled foods have worse data, and they smell a whole lot worse. Uh, so I, I like grains. Um, however, uh, those self-propelled foods are the ones that tend to eat our grains, so I felt to pay some attention. So one of the things we've really seen with these high prices or the, the questions have been about what's happened to animal numbers with these high prices, okay? And this matters because this is one of the two main sources of demand for U.S. row crops. And the difference between this and the other main source, or three main sources, exports, feed, and ethanol, okay, or biofuels. The reality is that this is the one that worries me the most about its ability to spring back. Ethanol, we did see reduce its, its consumption of corn by about 10%, but the plants are still there. Okay, they're ready to go back, prices get back in line, that production can snap back quite quickly. Exports, probably the same, at least closer. But in animal industries, I think it's not an unreasonable worry to say, if we see large numbers of animal facilities closing in this country, will they reopen if prices get back to a favorable level? I'm not saying the answer, I'm not suggesting the answer is yes or no, but I think it is worth stopping and asking ourselves that question. And so this year, I've tried to focus a little more on what effect these prices have had on animals. And what we see, beef cow slaughter, that dotted line, or the dash line on top, uh, dash blue line, 2011. Uh, the red line there is the last, is a previous five-year average. And what we see is 2012 in beef cow slaughter, it has been below uh, 2011's pace. 2011, very fast pace, driven a lot by liquidation in the southern Great Plains, that severe drought, of course, in Texas and Oklahoma in, in 11. Uh, we saw a lot of liquidation there. This year, we really haven't seen that same kind of liquidation. In fact, our, our farm in southwest Missouri, 
Uh, we were very droughty this year, very dry, uh, tight feed supplies. In fact, what we, where most of our sales went to as we worried about what to do with our animals was actually to Texas to replenish a lot of the herds in Texas. Okay, so we saw a lot of shifting, dislocation, but not actual liquidation. Dairy cow slaughter, 2012, again, that solid blue line. And what you do see, go back, you look in, it's really from April to May that that starts to diverge from either 2011 or the five-year average in the red line. And really since May, that number has been above both previous year and five-year average. We have seen a real liquidation of dairy cows. Uh, and I think it is reasonable to say that is due to feed prices and poor profitability. Okay? And again, this comes back to how long does it take to rebuild that demand? That's real demand for the feed market, and it is not demand that can be brought back quickly, especially in dairy or especially, you know, in, in cows. Um, sow slaughter, uh, we see sow slaughter running basically in line with pre, uh, prior year. No real changes there. Clearly profitability not great during the summer. It has recovered somewhat. The financial stress on that industry is not what it was. Broiler egg set, again, relatively in line with prior year. Certainly early in the year was weaker, but by the time we got into the higher feed prices, really not a big change right there. Lower than we've seen from six to 10, but that's true across the board. Chicks place, same story, okay? So, and again, I would argue chicks place, broilers, eggs, even hogs, not quite as important. The thing that I want to keep an eye on, and I suggest uh, we as a grain industry keep an eye on, really are these dairy cow and the beef cow slaughters, okay, and total inventories. Uh, chicks, I mean, let's face it, we can increase the number of poultry in this country in about, what, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Uh, when you're talking cows, it takes an awful lot longer to really have inventory adjustment to the upside. So it's a takeaway. Markets are really tight, and we see that in prices. And the real question is going to be how much demand was destroyed this summer. We're going to get a better idea of that over the coming months as a couple of the uh, USDA reports do come out, inventory reports, uh, feed usage report, or grain stocks reports that we can back out feed. And I think right now what the market really is worrying about is what are we going to plant in 2013? Okay, we start talking about all of those balance sheets that people are starting to, to update and think about. Uh, we go through the crops. Corn clearly doesn't want to give up any acreage from last year. It wants acreage. Very tight. Soybeans as well. I think both of those stay roughly flat. Uh, wheat, it's not going to give acreage. Uh, hard to say whether or not it increases. There's questions with this dryness, what exactly is going to happen come this spring. But it's not clear from a pure price and market standpoint that it's going to give acres. But the only crop that has acres to give, once again, is cotton. Okay, well, cotton is probably going to lose a million, uh, million and a half acres, seems to be the number out there. But that's not a tremendous amount of acres. And so we look around and say, where do those acres come from? And that's going to be something that I think is going to have a lot of impact on prices over the next six to eight, uh, next two to three months. So what do I say to do for 13? Uh, in 13, ensure, ensure, ensure. Uh, prices are going to be there. I think this is a year early marketing matters. Insurance gives you a little more flexibility for that. Um, I think basis improvements. Uh, I still think that this summer, especially in corn, there will be some opportunities to get really nice basis. Uh, I think we're going to see improved basis, but you're going to see a, a continued a lot of volatility in the futures prices. So if you're going to hold it and hope for that, it needs to be hedged storage, whether that's hedged on the board or whether that's hedged with an HTA or basis open or whatever they call it nowadays. Uh, if you need to, if you're worried about that big upside explosion, buy calls. But I'm not, I don't think that should be your primary concern. I do think, though, you'll make some money on basis. Uh, clearly, you're going to take a short-term hit on basis if the Mississippi closes. So just wait that out. It'll reopen. Livestock producers and users, uh, right now the risk is all in your court. Uh, I would say purchase 50% of your needs um, on your meal through March 1. Uh, if the Mississippi River closes, I'd use that as an opportunity to purchase the rest of your needs. Uh, at least through March 1. 
I think by then we should start to see maybe some prices weaken a little bit. Uh, corn, current prices, I think you're going to have an opportunity for pricing through March 1. I'm worried that by the time we hit Christmas, January, there will be some auctioning acres, in other words, bidding for acres, trying to pull acres in the different crops. We may see a rally for a while. Um, so I think right now are pretty good pricing opportunities. So with that, um, I guess time for a couple of questions, and then we'll send you on your merry way. Yeah, you didn't address uh, long-term drought or climate change. Um, I did not address long-term drought or climate change, right. And that's because I, I'm not doing long-term stuff, so those other guys should have address, addressed it. So you should really <laughs> missed your chance to ask them. No. I mean, here's my thing. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, OK? I mean, I can go back. I, I, I can go back. I can read people who talk about long-term drought. Um, I don't feel like I have enough authority or know people enough to be able to speak coherently on it. Clearly, there is some precedent uh, for long-term hydro, hydrological shifts. Um, I don't know what those probabilities are. Um, so I don't address that. I, obviously, it's not been a normal couple of years. I don't know how that, it's not yet clear to me if that changes the outlook for 2012 or 2013 in a systematic way. I've yet to meet somebody or talk to somebody who I think is not trying to sell me a newsletter um, who can really talk about that in a, in a scientific and coherent way. But if you know somebody, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I, I think it's a great area. Um, I'm, I'll be honest, it's one of the things on my to-do list. I'm finishing teaching here in a couple weeks just to be able to answer, because I'm going to hear that a lot. Uh, really for any grower. I mean, water is kind of important, I'm told. I mean, I was never great at biology. It's an irony that I'm in the job I'm in. Uh, but I'm pretty sure water is real useful for most, unless there's a marketing cacti, which who knows? Maybe we can make biofuels. Any other questions? Thank you for your question, though. Yeah. Have you checked into the livestock industry some more? Have they been purchasing protein through something other than the grains? And uh, we might have an issue competing with something else that we're not aware of right at the moment. Protein needs something? Not so much on the protein side. Um, I mean, the energy side, it, let's face it. OK, so when it comes to feed rations, so the question was, has the livestock industry been using, getting its protein from anywhere else? I mean, first of all, remember, there's, I think, seven or eight different potential reasonably common protein sources. Um, when you're doing the feed rations, you're just, it's a linear programming problem. Here's your, uh, here's your different nutritional requirements. Here's the cost. Find the least cost blend uh, that meets all these requirements. Uh, there's a long, long history of trying to push anything into there that they can, especially in extreme cases. And that's really what we have this year. So I mean, all these stories of, of cows getting fed candy we saw in the, you know, all this leftover Halloween candy. I wish the cows would have come to my house. Uh, it was crappy weather here. It was the one time I think it actually rained in October uh, in, at my house. I had lots of candy to feed them. Um, they should have started like a collection for that at Chick-fil-A. That would have been a perfect co-brand. Anyway, um, so there's been a lot of trying to get anything in there. I have not heard of anything, nor have I talked to anybody that leads me to believe there have been systematic shifts in protein. Okay? Uh, it's the same culprits as before. Uh, clearly, uh, it's gotten a little bit harder with DGS getting priced the way it has over the summer. Uh, they'd love a lower priced alternative. There's not really anything that's obvious out there. Food processing waste, you get phone calls all the time. Pardon? Food processing waste. Gets phone calls. Source, years ago, they couldn't give it away. Now can... Oh, yeah. I mean, there's really, I mean, you think about even eight years ago, drop a list just of the, of the things that in this room that you guys produce that you considered waste eight years ago. How much of that is still waste? You know, how many things that eight years ago or 10 years ago you were paying tipping fees for, now people are lining up to buy? I mean, it's, it's amazing the different world. That's a whole different talk, OK? But the way that that has shifted, I mean, people stealing used oil from McDonald's. Who would have thought of that a decade ago? But they all have locks now. It's another question. 
With that, let me take just a moment to remind you uh, your evaluation sheets. Um, please, if you could take a moment, fill those out, leave them on your chairs, or there's a basket outside. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I know Dr. McFerrin is not here, um, but I'd like to thank him in absentia for bankrolling this, uh, whether he yet realizes it or not. That's a <laughs> great thing about having a new dean. Uh, we were like, hey, he doesn't know. Let's start this over. Reboot. Uh, I'd also like to particularly thank, um, uh, particularly thank Nicole uh, and Janice, who truly, I mean, I, I know that there's something that, you know, you, there's this tradition, you thank them, but it's 90% the work back there. Um, whenever I try to nail down any numbers more accurate than that, they both say, oh, it's 80% her, 20 me, back and forth. But it's 90% them, about 10% me, uh, making today happen. Uh, so if you could please offer them a round of applause, uh, and also to all our speakers. Thank you all.